Hello, everybody. Hello. Yes. Welcome back to the marketing meetup. I feel like it's been absolutely forever since I've last seen you all. It's actually been three months because I skived off the last one. Um, so thank you very much to everyone that looked after it and thank you to everyone that came last time as well. So basically, I've missed you. Oh. <laughs> that deserves a bigger R. Oh. <laughs> so during those three months, I went to a proper, proper networking event, which is, I feel like a little bit like I was cheating on you all. Um, <laughs> And I say proper because as I walked in, um, everyone was in their little cocoons or the Roman tortoise shell formations uh, to try and break in. Uh, everyone was selling to each other. Um, they weren't smoking as well, fortunately, but um, it wasn't necessarily a nice environment. And it was just really hard. But it doesn't have to be hard. It doesn't actually have to be that hard because the lovely, lovely thing about this group of people, like for the past 21, 22 events, is that you've just essentially been normal people to each other. And you've spoken to each other and you've asked questions about like what you like and what you don't like. And uh, after you've spoken about that, then you might have done business afterwards. But um, essentially, you've got to know each other as human beings first. So that's what this marketing meetup's all about. Gold star to all of you guys. So thank you all very much for coming. I really appreciate it. If you ever want to email me, I'm at joe at themarketingmeetup.com. Uh, I am horrendous at answering emails, so um, sorry. Joseph E. Glover is as close as we get to a Twitter handle because I don't maintain the Twitter for the Marketing Meetup. And if you want to tweet about the Marketing Meetup tonight, you can use hashtag the Marketing Meetup, where previous tweets all are. At this point, my monotone drawings uh, continue, but to introduce Chris briefly. Uh, so. Chris is here to speak to you about something. <laughs> so I work for a program called Innovate to Succeed. Um, and that is a program delivered by Innovate UK and European Regional Development Fund. So there's a pot of money to support businesses that are innovating and by that I mean you're either taking something new to market or it's new to your firm and you have to be an SME to qualify for that. But if that's you or you know somebody that is in that space and they're looking to build a rocket, we as a team of people, innovation advisors, I'm one of six and I work out of St. John's Innovation Centre, um, are here to help with a mentoring programme. So we can support innovation with strategic support, guidance, planning, marketing, IP, access to finance. There's a whole toolkit, diagnostic stuff to help you build that rocket better and ensure that it gets into the right orbit and stays there. And that probably means it needs to be fully fueled with cash. Um, and you get access to those advisors for up to seven days. So, that, so there's no money, there is money to pay for me, up to seven days, provided by Innovate UK and European Regional Development Fund. So come next March, that's going to get a little bit confusing. So I would suggest, I'm, I'm doing this four days a week, I still have one day a week when I'm a marketing guy, uh, but for the, uh, for the other four days I'm an innovation advisor. But come next March, it, it, it could be that Innovate UK take on, because it's match funded at the minute, it could be that Innovate UK say, we'll, we'll, we'll just pay roll the whole thing, because it has been a success across the UK. Um, if you're wondering what Exemplus is, that's the delivery business that, that employs me. Exemplus is a business owned by the Har uh, University of Hertfordshire. Uh, it also employs um, the Department of International Trade Advisors over at St. John's and the European Network uh, Advisors. So it's a business that's, that knows about delivering support to uh, SME businesses. So I, uh, Joe very kindly let me stand up here and tell you this because it's free. Um, it's great support if you're trying to build a rocket. And um, <laughs> that's, that's my call to action. <laughs> And that's me. Thank you, Joe. 
So tonight, uh, our speakers, we have two exceptionally brilliant human beings. Um, we have the ridiculously young, ridiculously handsome, uh, me, no, <laughs> uh, 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 Harry Seaton uh, from Fluential, who will be talking about marketing to the generation who don't care. That's the, they might not. They might not. We, we will find out. And we also have James Parton, who is the MD at the Bradfield Centre, which, if you haven't been to, just generally, I think people can just walk in and have a look. Can they? Yeah, anyone can walk in. Yeah. Walk in. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> absolutely. But it's a wicked space, and uh, likewise, James is going to dazzle and amaze your brains with synapse-inducing, uh, electrifying marketing-based content. That's me done. I need to pass over to the talent now. Um, so first up, we have Harry who is going to be talking right now. So please give him a huge round of applause. Hello, my name's Harry, um, but I'll get onto that in just a second. My talk is about how to make the generation that doesn't care, care, and that generation is me, um, and probably quite a few people here as well. Um, and uh, often as well, you'll find that there could be a counter argument to this. It's not necessarily that we don't care. It might actually be that we just don't see. But there is quite a lot for us to care about these days. Quite a lot of people who pretend to care about a lot of things as well and actually don't, um, me being one of them. And uh, today I'm going to talk to you about how you can cut through to them and make sure that the thing they do care about is you and your brand. Who am I? So my name's Harry. Um, and yeah, as Joe said, um, I'm quite young. Uh, I'm 21, actually. Um, and uh, probably act about 12, but I'm from Kings Lynn, so not too far from here, um, and I run Fluential. Fluential is an influencer marketing agency which is uh, luckily supported by a much larger group of agencies um, who are also very good at what they do, so they've enabled me to pursue this um, and help people market themselves um, using influencers. I also make mediocre pop music as well. I know a couple of you have already told me that you've managed to find that. Um, all I can do is apologize. Um, but today, I'm here in a professional capacity, would you believe it, despite obviously wearing my t-shirt and trainers, to talk to you about stuff. Influencer marketing. So the only way to really start this is to, uh, is to talk about influencer marketing in a nutshell. Because I'm sure you've heard about this quite a lot and probably heard a lot of different things about influencer marketing. It's been in the news quite a lot, not always for the best reasons. And there's a lot of shady people involved, a lot of people doing things they perhaps shouldn't. So I'm going to break it down really simple and tell you what it is. Influencer marketing is essentially peer-to-peer -peer recommendations. Um, and uh, you'll often hear people make the case that anyone is an influencer. Some of you are influencers because you're influencers to your friends and family. Uh, maybe you've just recommended a hotel that you stayed at and they've gone and stayed at it. It's essentially that principle but amplified. So the greatest influencers are obviously the ones with the strongest connections to their audiences because they're actually able to influence. And there are a lot of people who are kind of acting as influencers almost, who are so far detached now with their millions and millions of followers that, yeah, they might look good holding your product or something like that, but realistically, people aren't actually engaging with their opinions, and it doesn't actually mean a great deal to them. So the way around this that we found uh, has been integration. So in order for someone to actually have influence, you need to trust their decisions. Um, and whilst you might trust your friend's decision on, uh, on a hotel or something, if you know that it's something that they don't really know anything about, you're probably not going to trust their decision. So, of course, in turn, if you've got a fitness influencer and they start talking about knitting or something like that, something completely random, you're not going to go and buy those knitting products. Equally, if they're just stood there holding the product like this and uh, forcing a smile maybe like this, great, that's a good smile, isn't it? That'll sell you a few things. And there's some kind of caption as well on Instagram, which realistically, who reads the caption of an Instagram post? It's a visual platform. How well is that going to perform for a brand? It's not going to perform very well because no one's actually paid attention to what you've said about the brand and no one actually cared about the fact that that influencer has endorsed that product. So when it comes to integration, the first milestone that you've kind of got to, got to achieve is choosing influencers that match the brand that you're trying to promote. But more importantly than that, you've got to make sure that the content actually fits, fits the product. How many times have you watched a movie and there's really cringy product placement and you just think, well, they've paid a million dollars to be in that and it doesn't actually mean anything to you and you haven't gone home and bought that Samsung laptop. Sorry if anyone from Samsung's here. I don't own a Samsung laptop, surprisingly. And um, it's just not really meant anything to you. But if you're able to fully integrate the product into the content that the influencer is producing, then suddenly 
it resonates a little, a little better. It sticks in their mind, the fact that maybe they had to use that to achieve that experience. Um, the only real way that I can, I can talk to you about this, I guess, is to give an example of something we've done. Uh, we work for a large insurance company called Adrian Flux. We do a lot of stuff for them. And I'm tasked with making insurance fun with influencers, which is quite tricky. And if I were to get an influencer to post on Twitter saying, all of you guys should ring up Adrian Flux today and get a quote, who, who is actually going to bother to do that? Absolutely no one. I don't care if they've got 10 million followers or 15 or 20 million followers. Maybe that will generate a few, but who's actually going to bother to do that? No one wants to. Especially with insurance as well, when it's a product that you might not necessarily be ready to buy at that given time. So what we did instead was took a bunch of influencers and got them to drive the UK's biggest monster truck, which sounds a bit bizarre, um, and it's probably quite hard to tie that into insurance, especially considering they were driving over other cars, which obviously probably insurance companies don't normally want you to do. <laughs> but the reason why it worked is because of the principle and the integration between what we were trying to sell and what they were doing. So we were trying to sell learner driver insurance. We had people, we're trying to push Adrian Flux to everyone who's learning to drive, so they all come following, coming along to Adrian Flux, picking up the phones and getting a quote. Well, these guys had to learn how to drive a monster truck because most people aren't born knowing how to do it. And it was quite an engaging piece of content to watch. We took people who were usually quite daring within their content, so that instantly matches the kind of theme of what we're going for here. And we made sure that their audience were actually young people from the UK because that's where they sell to, that's who they're selling to. And suddenly by integrating that, we're able to capture all the data that we need to then push Adrian Flux to and make sure that we actually get results. So that's what we're talking about when we're on about integration. So next time you see a picture of uh, a travel photographer hoovering outside with their Dyson, they're never going to do that really. They've done it because they've been paid 1,500 quid. Micro-influencers and the importance of engagement. Um, this, is, this is one of my favorite ones to talk about. And the reason being is because some people have deemed that my mediocre pop music is actually enjoyable. And they've decided to listen to it. And I've managed to grow a bit of a following for myself online. Would you believe it? I, trust me, I couldn't believe it. So I, as much as it makes me cringe to say this, I kind of fit myself into this bracket. I will, I'm, in a minute, I'm going to walk out there with my head hung in shame because honestly, I, I hate describing myself as an influence and I hate that this talk has made me, but I've got to for context. Micro-influencers are typically people with those smaller audiences. We can try and categorize them and say 5,000 to 100,000 followers. But realistically, the engagement is what makes them the micro-influencers, the engagement and the communities that they build. Because massive, large-scale influencers might be able to partner up with Superdrug and ship out a, a product in mass quantity. But the micro-influencers are the ones who are in the comment section. They're doing the groundwork. They're replying to the fans of them that are actually inquiring and talking to them. And that's where the trust comes in. And that's where these people are able to build these relationships. When, when we're looking at influencer marketing campaigns, it's always important to note that no matter how appealing that the big influencer might look, you might want to use Zoella because she's got 15,000 billion subscribers. But realistically, how many of those people actually pay attention? It goes back to that again, the integration. How many of those people trust her and what she's about and what she's promoting? And then how many people of the 5,000 who follow you know, so-and-so on Instagram who only ever talks about similar products to what you're using, how many of those people trust them? And what are they charging as well? And if you were to have this, a, a certain amount of those people that equaled a similar following to what Zoella's total gets to or whatever, and chances are you're going to see much better results and probably going to spend a lot less money as well. So you're going to make more money and spend less money. And that's why micro-influencers should never be overlooked. If someone has only maybe even 2,000 followers, it's not to say that they're not worth talking to when it comes to your brand. Because the thing is, the chances are, especially with people like this, one of the things that we always think is these influencers, they love brand work. It's a bit of an achievement for them. And I've seen it before. I've seen people with 10,000 followers. They've done a, a deal with Coca-Cola. Uh, and all of a sudden, all their friends are congratulating them. Even though it's sponsored content and it's an advert, they're congratulating them. Because that's amazing. They've only got 10,000 followers. They've worked with Coca-Cola. But that audience, have, they're a community of people who support this person. They support what they're achieving, and therefore they support their views as well. And it works. It brings in the engagement. They're able to command that audience to click through, to subscribe to something, to, to do whatever you, want, you as a brand want them to do to make sure that they're going to be a customer. And that's why they're so important. 
I didn't really try and be witty with any of these slides, you probably noticed, but this is one where I tried and completely failed, because without the song, it's just completely wasted. But as I was talking about, Zoella has umpteen millions of subscri subscribers, and ultimately, all it is is a vanity metric. And vanity metrics are the one thing that I hate. Likes, comments, shares, all of that rubbish. And the reason why I hate it is because when has a board ever sat down and said, Oh, we have a, we've had quite a bad performing month this year. Oh yeah, but we've got 12,000 likes on our latest Instagram post, so we'll be fine. It's never been said because it doesn't matter. In the grand scheme of things, it doesn't really matter. Yeah, sure, if you've got a big social and you're pulling in big numbers, you're probably, you've got a nice engaged audience that you're able to sell to. Those things normally go hand in hand. But we're talking about someone else's content here. We're talking about an influencer who's generating likes on their own posts. What's that benefiting your brand if those people aren't coming through and buying from you or using your service? So the most important thing, I think, to remember with all influencer marketing campaigns, and obviously because of the length of this talk, it's impossible for me to go fully into detail and tell you about all the things that you should be caring about, but I can highlight a few. You need to be looking into how much conversation you're starting around your brand and how far is that going to last after this campaign's finished? Is this campaign going to continue to keep your brand on, the, on people's tongues? Are people going to keep talking about it afterwards? What have you captured that you can then use to serve adverts to? You remember, that the influencer is spreading awareness of your brand. They are spreading awareness. And these people are going to see your brand, if you get the integration right, in a really nice way. And that's quite a powerful thing, because then whenever they see an advert, they've already got that really good opinion of your brand in their mind. They're going to remember that they discovered you because of this. And that's going to help them. The advocacy the influencer provides is going to help you in all your future marketing efforts. So how are you going to be able to contact them afterwards? Because if they've just liked an influencer's post, you're not going to be able to. Now, it's more than just kind of getting, getting people to follow you, because if people have to follow you to, say, enter a competition, Chances are, once they realize they haven't won, they're going to unfollow you again. Capturing data is where it's really at. Emails, things like that. If you can build an email list, you can turn it into a social audience on Facebook. You can capture them with Facebook pixels and all of that. Then you can have an audience that have already engaged with your brand in a really nice way. They're going to be much easier to convert into customers later down the line. And one uh, other little nugget that I'll kind of leave you with as well, something that we've been doing a lot of recently, is Facebook Messenger subscriber lists. If you can get influencers to point people through to Facebook Messenger, they'll subscribe really easily, and they're seeing four times to 10 times more click-throughs than emails, and 80% open rates, which is pretty outstanding, to be honest. Not only that, but how often are people on Facebook Messenger? They're using it to contact. If you're able to cut through there, and cut through because they've allowed you to, then you're in a really powerful position. Looking ahead. So at the, f at the start of this talk, I mentioned that some of you might have heard of influencers uh, in the news recently for bad reasons, fake influencers, and you know people just reporting vanity metrics back and saying, you got two million likes and a, a billion comments, but we haven't made you a penny. That is happening. Uh, uh, and, it, and it's always going to happen in the influencer marketing world for as long as brands continue to work with agencies that fulfill to those kind of KPIs. And there's always going to be influencers who are buying followers, because there's always going to be services that allow you to buy followers. And the only real advice I can give to anyone who's looking to, to stay away from that is to invest yourself. These influencers are invested in what they're doing and their audience are invested in what they're doing. So you, to, the only way that you can fully understand them is to observe how well they're performing on a daily basis, looking at their normal posts, looking at their sponsored posts. You could take the average of likes that someone's got in their past six posts, but ultimately they might be annoying people when they've worked with brands because they've done it so often and therefore you're not going to get 1,000 likes, you're going to get maybe 500, which means you're only going to convert maybe a couple of people instead of a few hundred. It's all these types of things that you need to consider. But in terms of influencer content and where it's going, I think static posts are just going to fade away. And I really hope they do because they are boring. You see someone just holding a product, it's not fun to look at. You don't want that on your Instagram. People are going to be unfollowing the influencers that are doing it, and it's going to turn them off to the brands that are getting them to do it. If you really want to succeed with influencer marketing, you need to take it back to what it is, and it's content. You need to think about what is going to be the best content I can do, and find a way to pair that with your influencer. Use them to push it out and to make sure that people are going to take the action you want them to take, but don't, let, don't just think it's enough to give them a piece, of, a piece of your product and let them do it. Make sure that you have got something that people will want to see and that people will be talking about long after they've seen it. 
I'll probably whiz through this again. I think last time I had about 15 minutes and was probably done in about three. Um, I tend to talk quite fast. But I hope you have enjoyed it. I'll just say a big thank you, um, especially to Joe for having me back again. I spoke at a Norwich one earlier in the year, and it was fantastic. These events really are great. I'm going to be hanging around, so if anyone wants to talk to me, I know I've got questions in a minute, but if, if I don't answer anything that you want answered after, then please do come up and talk to me. Also, I forgot all my business cards at home, so I've got a nice little slide here of my info. So if anyone wants to contact me after, this is the way. But thank you very much for having me. My name's been Harry. Um, yeah, and I look forward to meeting you all in a minute. Good work, Harry. I just think you're an outstanding human being, so cracking work. Um, and moving on swiftly, James, please come on up. <clears throat> Hi everyone. How many people in the room would kind of call themselves a marketer at either a startup or a smaller size company? Okay. And for the people that didn't raise their hands, are you in kind of larger corporates or large organizations or agencies? What's the kind of show of hands for that? Okay, there's a few people that don't know what they do, which is really interesting. <laughs> <laughs> um, second question is, how many people um, are kind of would class themselves as working in tech or marketing tech products? Okay, that's good. The lens of the, the, I mean, the lens of the talk, which I'll get into in a second, bear with me, um, is through the kind of lens of being in a startup and marketing tech products. But hopefully there's something in there for every, everyone, and, and you hopefully might be able to take something away from it. Um, but we'll see. You can tell me at the end if you, if you did or not. Um, so first slide is not a brag, and it's also not the failed script of my rom-com, um, which is three telcos, two not-for-profits, two startups, one IPO, and a collaborative workspace. That's just a summary of what I've been doing for the last 20 or so years. For the folks in Cambridge, you'll probably know me if you do know me from the Bradfield Center, but that's a relatively new chapter in my career. I've actually been spending most of my career marketing and building product in startups and corporates, which is where a lot of this content comes from. Um, and the slide, like I say, it isn't a brag, but it kind of is. Um, so one of the startups I worked for IPO'd. Um, so I've kind of been very privileged to go through that classic unicorn story that we all hear told of um, for startups that start from very little and become billion dollar companies and go to go public. So I am in the middle of that photo somewhere, standing outside the New, New York Stock Exchange back in June 2016. Um, but that's just to reassure you that Joe doesn't have some, pick some random guy off the street to come and talk to you, but I have, I have done some stuff. Um, right, so to the talk, it's really built around kind of five themes, and I'm not sure if it's kind of hangs together, but you, again, you can tell me at the end. Uh, the first one is removing friction and complexity. And, and this is kind of your baseline, which is why it's zero. Um, and obviously, the whole talk is about building a movement and uh, anointing heroes, which hopefully will make sense as we go through. So, so really, I think sometimes, certainly in my experience, I think marketing can sometimes be pigeonholed around comms advertising, PR, those kinds of things. In my mind, actually, marketing is vital across every part of the organization. And as marketers, we should be doing absolutely everything we can do to spot and remove getting your customer from discovering you, to using you, to spending money with you. And you should be obsessive about finding any barrier or any point of friction that might stop them achieving that goal. So really, you know, if, and certainly for the folks working in tech and startups, but this applies hopefully to anyone, is don't rely on your engineering teams to figure this out <laughs> <laughs> in the nicest possible way. Um, so, you know, I think about the product design, I think about product discovery, product sign-up, first use, upgrading, downgrading. Um, the first time you make a payment, taking money off people is always an emotional time. Um, customer service, um, all of these are really important things that marketers should be all over. Because you really are the voice of the customer in the organization. But don't confuse removing complexity as removing uh, functionality or the power. The key is about just removing friction and complexity. And to give you a couple of examples of this, certainly in my Twilio days, we talked a lot about the mentality of people that build hardware versus the mentality of people that build software. So to give you two examples of this, how many people have got a TV remote control in their house that looks something like that? How many of you have pressed all the buttons and know what they do? 
one person. I salute you, sir. Because I don't know about you, but I think I'm quite technical, but I have no clue what most of those buttons do. And it tends to be button mashing to find out, and sometimes things happen, sometimes they don't. Um, contrast that to a remote control designed by a software company, which is the Apple TV remote control. I don't know if you've got Apple TVs, they haven't sold tons, but in terms of this kind of comparison, the software mentality is reduce the hardware down to the, the, the minimum possible specification. And you really only need three buttons because all the power, all the functionality is in software, not the hardware. Um, another example, lovely credit card machines. So I, ha I still cannot tip correctly using these machines in restaurants because <laughs> it starts with the numbers and it doesn't feel intuitive. I don't know, it just never works for me. Um, if you look at a software-driven business like Square, are you familiar with Square? Basically, you plug in that little plastic, white piece of plastic, which is not great contrast on this screen, into any existing device, and you suddenly have a fully-featured credit card machine with an intuitive user interface that both the customer and the restaurateur can understand. Much better customer experience. And I think the most important thing about this is not just the user interface design and the kind of the perspective, is the fact that the remote control for the TV and the credit card machine on the left, they can only do one thing. They never get any better from the minute they're manufactured to the minute you chuck them in the recycling bin. Whereas software-driven products get better every day when new software releases come through. And that's why by minimizing the kind of the, the functionality on the hardware, it frees you up to deliver continuous improvements to the customer which is something as marketers we should all be absolutely obsessed with. Okay, so first one, movements need causes. So it's unlikely that people are just going to use your product. You might be very lucky and you do find that situation happening, but let's kind of assume that it doesn't happen because that's certainly the majority of the situations. So you really need to think about kind of what's your radical, why should people care about what you're doing. So if I just spend a little time talking about the kind of experience with Twilio, has anyone heard of Twilio? Oh, okay. So that's better than I thought. But uh, so Twilio is a very hardcore technology company, and I won't bore you with the details. But it's uh, an API business, which basically means it's a software developer tool business. And when you kind of boil it down, the actual thing that Twilio does is very boring, and it's very old. It's making software developers. Um, uh, program the telephone network. So you can make telephones ring, you can send text messages, you can do chat sessions. But fundamentally, the technology is not new. Um, so really, Twilio's rally, rally call was really around the empowerment of the software developer as an actual audience of people. Because actually, for, for many years, especially software developers in corporates and larger organizations, they were quite uh, an ignored and downtrodden group of people. Um, typically, they were seen as a resource that were just given projects to deliver, and they weren't empowered. So one of our key marketing insights was the empowerment of these people. So we really positioned Twilio as providing kind of democratic access to the telephone networks for the first time, because if anyone's worked in telecoms or has brought telecom services, it's controlled by you know, big, large corporations and their gatekeepers. It's very opaque. It's effectively a black box. And if you're not an expert in telecoms, especially if you're a small business like a startup, it's very difficult to do business with telco companies. So really, we wanted to kind of position Twilio as providing like um, democratic access, a level playing field, and, and really allow you to program the telecoms network without any specialist knowledge, um, without having deep pockets, which is obviously important for a startup business. Um, you know, you, you can't sign up to very long, expensive contracts. You need to be able to have flexibility and experiment. Um, and, and actually, most importantly, you, don't, you didn't need permission from your boss or your procurement team to actually use the service. Um, you know, the historical way, way of buying software and IT products is you go through this horrible, elongated RFP process. Your company decides that you're, you're an official vendor. You get purchased, and then you have to go through your IT department to get service, right? That just doesn't work anymore. That's a completely antiquated kind of way of working. And what you see is, over the last 10 years, is a lot of software firms have had great success making their product accessible to anyone through simple credit card purchases. So you've seen companies like Evernote, Dropbox, Trello. Are you familiar with these names? 
These are all tools and services that actually the individual users in a company start buying because they do what they need them to do, and they have lost the confidence and patience going to the traditional channel of talking to their procurement team to solve those problems. So we definitely locked on to that kind of that trend. And it, you know, even today, 10 years down the line with Twilio, there's still that kind of magical moment where a software developer can type a piece of code on a screen and their phone rings because you're bridging the kind of virtual world with the real like, hardware reality, and it's still a, quite a, a great thing to kind of see. And like I say, the thing that's similar to Dropbox, Evernote, all these companies, is it creates this Trojan horse effect, because what we actually saw in a lot of cases was the internal developers might be working on a passion project, or they might be hacking at a weekend. They prototype something that solves a problem for their business, and then effectively, the internal software team become your sales team because they're pitching it to their bosses saying, this is exactly what we need, yeah, and we need to deploy this in a commercial situation. So you do get that kind of real Trojan horse effect, and that became our radical. You know, it's really much, so the marketing and the positioning of it was very much like, you know, we get you, we're, we are you. You know, Twilio was founded and run by software developers. You know, we also hate antiquated systems and bureaucracy. Um, and we, and we, the, thing, the real personal bugbear is that attitude of that elitism that you're too small for us to worry about. And really, the attitude that I've always carried with me is you never know who you're talking to at any one point in time. You could be talking to the next billion-dollar company. You have no clue. So you need to make sure that you're, you treat everyone equally and you give everyone an equal amount of both time and resources to develop their idea. So, so really, you, know, you need to position yourselves as a positive wind of change. You need to create a sense of urgency and excitement for that change to happen. And you need to create um, the belief that users of your products and services are going to win, ultimately. Um, but of course, it kind of all needs to be delivered with authenticity. That's really important. And we haven't got enough time to talk about authenticity. That's how kind of talk in itself. But obviously, any claim that you make, you have to be able to back up. It has to be achievable. And it needs to be credible coming from your brand. So the other, point, the other part of the title is anointing heroes. So every cause needs a hero. And what I mean by heroes is looking at your early users, your power users, your early adopters. Oh, thank you. You're very kind. Um, so the key here, and kind of similar to what Harry was saying, really, in terms of influencer marketing, um, you know, recognizing your early adopters and enabling them to become advocates of what you're doing is really important. And that's certainly where we saw all of our growth come from. <clears throat> and from a marketing perspective, thank you, that's great. From a marketing perspective, telling real stories is always the way to go, back to that authenticity point. Um, and obviously, the more creative those stories are, the better. Anyone remember Halo, the cab sharing service in London when that launched, now taken over by my taxi? But they were kind of, it was like an Uber experience, but for black cabs. They never talked about how many black cab rides they enabled from, say, Covent Garden to King's Cross, because that's kind of boring and no one cares. Um, they, talk, they, they always use an example of uh, a woman getting a black cab from London to Lisbon on their app, because it's quirky, it's not what you expect, and it, there's that kind of story that draws you in. So the more quirky, the more interesting, the more creative uses that you see people using your product for. And the great thing about this is um, <clears throat> often people end up using your product for things you never dreamt that they would do, right? Um, so working in a, in a tools business, you had that luxury of um, effectively Twilio made Lego building blocks. So we defined the brick, but we didn't define what you could build with them. So you're constantly being kind of surprised and delighted with what people come up with. So for example, you know, a common use case for Twilio, because it's about communications, is building contact centers. But no one wants to talk about contact centers. It's the bo most boring thing in the world. But when you find someone like Lisa, who uses Twilio to light up clothing, it becomes really interesting. So Lisa runs um, a fashion brand in Berlin, and she's integrated Twilio into her clothing through conductive thread and LEDs, so you can text message her clothes, and they change, their lights come on, they change color and stuff like that. So it's just really creative, really, insp really inspiring. So at Twilio, we called our heroes doers. Um, because we felt doers indicated someone that was actually proactive in terms of either building a company or building a product um, or software, right? Because we're talking you know, to developers. And everyone always kind of loves and identifies with either an underdog or a real visionary kind of upstart company that's kind of making a difference. So we're always looking for those kind of interesting use cases to case study. 
So, you know, think about, is there an opportunity for you to champion, champion kind of ne neglected constituents with the, the things that you do, um, to try to build that kind of that movement and those heroes, um, and really kind of demonstrate your empathy and your understanding of that constituent. Obviously, it helps if you've got the same kinds of people in your organization, because that kind of really adds to the, the authenticity and also helps you kind of identify their unmet needs and obviously that's the key to marketing, right? If you have unmet needs and you solve them, you're gonna sell products. But of course, you know, it comes with a warning as well because there's a fine line between building a movement and building a cult. So you don't want to have something that's too niche. And it's really important that all your messaging and your communication is not exclusive. It always has to be inclusive. So you can speak to a, a, a very targeted audience with a very specific message, but always be mindful not to exclude anyone else from participating. Because <clears throat> obviously you want everyone to have a positive experience with your brand. The next one, um, and there's only two more <laughs> before I fall over. Um, sell the success of your users, not your product. Um, might sound a little bit counterintuitive, but it very much builds on the kind of theme of that last slide. So, you know, your prospective customers, if they're shopping you online or talking to you at a conference, they want, use, they want use cases, they want case studies, they want examples, they want inspiration. And, and people gravitate to success because anyone that's going to advocate your product to either their boss or their friends, they're putting their personal reputation on the line and maybe even their career. So they want to align themselves to success. So you have to reassure them that people that use your product have been successful because that's ultimately going to kind of influence their decision in either direction. Spoken a little bit about what Twilio does, and I'm sure you're going to glaze over if I go into any more detail, but imagine selling a programming API to non-software developers. I'm sure you'd all walk off if I started to try and do that. But that's why we kind of found people like uh, Dr. Max Little, who's a professor at Aston University. And he has just an inspirational use case of how he's used our technology in a, complete, in a way we would never have jumped off ourselves. So what Max has done is he's working on the identification and treatment of Parkinson's disease. And he's developed an algorithm which allows you to sample a telephone call where someone speaks into the phone for 30 seconds. The algorithm detects vibrations in your vocal cords and could give a 98% accuracy if you're on the spectrum for, for Parkinson's disease. So this immediately removes the need to go to a clinic take a 200 pound you know, cost test, allows people to mass um, screen themselves. So this is potentially revolutionary stuff. And if you tell that story versus I stand here and talk to you about building a call center, you can see how the kind of the different take on the same product has a completely different impact on people. And obviously, you know, by doing this is a real win-win situation because you create interesting content for your brand and an engagement opportunity with your audiences but the people you feature also gain the marketing benefit of that as well because people always want PR for their company or their product. People, you know, they might be seeking investment and this kind of publicity tips them over to get that investment. Um, if they're working in a corporate, recognition and success of their project might help them with career progression and everyone always wants to go home and brag to mum and dad and friends and family, right? So if you appear in the press, it's good for everyone. So as marketers, you know, to enable these kinds of stories, it is all about being on top of your metrics, on top of your audience, to spot these outliers with these really interesting use cases, and then focusing your effort on enablement and education, so content, tools, getting started. Back to that early point about getting people through the gates as quickly as possible from kind of experimentation through to revenue. And of course, nurturing your community at all times. Most importantly, online and offline, don't discount the, the benefit of face-to-face -face contact when you're building your brands and your communities. Run meetup groups, go to meetup groups, build your conferences. You know, that human interaction, especially when you're selling technology, it's all about human interaction and relationships, right? And you know, most importantly, celebrate successes when you have them. Because like I say, people, are, people radiate to success. And if you want people to endorse you, they need that confidence that they're not risking too much by endorsing you. They need those proof points. Build in complacency traps. So what I mean by this is these days, I mean, there are a few unique ideas still out there, but in the main, a lot of startups come from spotting an opportunity where an industry is controlled by incumbent players, and those incumbent players have become 
um, complacent, essentially. You know, as, as companies grow, you become less customer-centric. The organization size builds in politics and inertia. Um, and of course, it's easy to get hung on to legacy revenue streams, which kind of then is counterintuitive to investing in innovation because you don't want to kill your cash cows. So, you know, when you look at recent developments, good examples might be Airbnb versus hotels. It might be Uber versus taxis. I know Uber comes with a whole other set of baggage, but, um, you know, these are all startups that have grown from spotting um, incumbent industries which were slow moving and not innovating. So, I mean, it is kind of human nature to get complacent when you do get success. So as your team grows, it's kind of inevitable, and again, this is more for the startup crowd, but also I think it applies. It's inevitable that as you grow your organization, you hire more people. Those new hires are never going to be as emotionally attached to the idea as the founding team. That's just the nature of the game, right? So you should be always thinking about how do you spot and remove complacency everywhere around your business and ensure collaboration and teamwork across the cross-functional teams is always there because that will kill you. So some examples of that could be Twilio's business model was a pay-as-you-go business model. So you pay per transaction. So if you make a phone call, you pay a little bit of money. If you send a text message, you pay a little bit of money. But the point being is there's no contract. So there's no sense of complacency because someone can literally stop using you within two minutes of you pissing them off. So you're incentivized every day to come to work and do your best work because you know your customers could leave you at any time. And that's quite different from the old way of selling IT. The old days, you know, for the folks that have been around a while, you'd have your guy from IBM show up, sell you a massive system with a 10-year contract and probably 60% of the cost of service and support. And that's just dead in the water now because the SaaS business models have completely ruined that business model for companies like that. Another example, and I'll mention the Bradfield Center, I mean, it's not a Bradfield Center pitch, but I've kind of I've brought a couple of that, a couple of those things into the kind of mentality that we're doing at the Bradfield, and I see some faces here that are actually at the Bradfield, so hello. Um, number one is the longest lease that we um, ask you to commit to for an office at the Bradfield is three months. So we know if we piss any of our, of our members off, they're going to leave us within three months. So again, that forces us to deliver a great experience every day. The other thing, we ask our members to rate us on Google. So if you go to Google, type in the Bradfield Center, I think we're at something like 120 Google reviews in our first year. So we're kind of living or dying based on people's perception of what we do, not what we actually do, but people's perception of what we do. And that's a very transparent way to make sure that not only people that don't come to the Bradfield get a sense of what we're about, but also it's a great way for us to show is one of our key kind of customer satisfaction metrics. Obviously, we can talk about things like net promoter scores, NPS, and stuff like that. But you know, Google ratings keeps us honest and makes sure that we do a great job, or at least we strive to do a great job every time someone has an interaction with us. So one thing we do at my company, Central Working, who runs the Bradfield Center, is everyone reviews new candidates when they're offered jobs. So we have an online platform. Everyone watches a video of the candidate, and everyone has a vote in the company. So there's a real sense of kind of uh, empowerment and engagement that everyone is part of that process of selecting new people, joining the business. If you have a large organization and you have an onboarding program where people come into the organization, get trained up on the culture, the kind of specifics, make sure you run those programs with mixed teams so people can form friendships across the organization within the first week of joining. Um, everyone should be answering support calls. You know, if you're selling stuff to customers, everyone in your organization should be talking to customers. Otherwise, how do you know what customers think about your products? Building on that, everyone in your company should know how to build with your product if you're selling something that makes other things. So again, even if you're not, even at, if, at Twilio, even if you weren't a software developer, you were expected to program a soft, an app with Twilio. If you couldn't code, you could get a buddy to help you code, but everyone went through that process. Because otherwise, how have you got any empathy with what your customers experience on a day-to-day -day basis? And, and kind of similar to the support call, similar to using the product, everyone in your company should be able to sell the product, regardless of who they are. Because everyone is going to have an interaction with a customer at some point in their day-to-day -day working, or even in their personal lives. So everyone should be able to pitch your company and what you do and what your product does. And I kind of touched on the kind of arrogance of the kind of larger companies that creeps in. Again, just treat everyone as your next potential multi-million pound customer because you have no idea. 
don't, if, if you could pick them, then you'd all be billionaire VCs. And I'm, I'm assuming most of us aren't billionaire VCs in the room. And then finally, I'll go really quick, just on this last one, um, obsess or go home. I love this guy. This is fantastic. Any Star Wars fans in the room? <laughs> he kind of likes Darth Vader, I'm getting the idea. Um, <laughs> so, you know, if you're... The point with this slide, right, is I have had a bit of an insight into a, what it's like working in Silicon Valley in a high-growth company. And if you're not all in on this journey and you're not spending all of your time obsessing about making your company and your product better, you should really stop because there's people out there that are absolutely doing that. And it's very likely they're going to be doing something in your space as well. Um, so there is no scope for any complacency in anything you do. Don't let anyone outwork you. You know, you should be working as much as, of course, there's a work-life balance, and of course, you know, mental well-being and stress and all those kinds of things are super important. But within reason, don't let anyone outwork you. You should be working to the bone to make your company successful. Um, because, I've, you know, I've seen that energy, that focus, that drive that other people have got. Um, there's a reason why companies are successful from Silicon Valley. It's not just access to capital. So you've got to bring your A game every day, and that's why building in those kind of traps to, ca to catch that complacency creeping in are kind of really important. Um, and, you know, success, whatever you define personally success as, um, it just doesn't fall in your lap. Successful people are successful for a reason. So I think I've waffled on for enough. Uh, you can chat to me, obviously, afterwards, or I'll take some questions. You can get the slides from that URL and come and hang out at the Bradfield Centre. Crack them up. I really, really enjoyed that, so I hope you all did too. Um, so some last things from me. Uh, these talks will be available on the Marketing Meetup podcast. Um, which is available wherever you get podcasts, I think, more or less now. Um, so you just need to search for The Marketing Meetup Podcast, and you will hear my flat voice uh, introducing it, followed by enthusiastic and knowledgeable people uh, speaking about marketing-based topics. We also have our website, which is sort of as, as the network grows and more Marketing Meetup uh, events happen. It will be a hub for all the content and the community. We have wonderful content uh, produced. There's a brand new blog post uh, up right now, so I demand that you go and check it out right now. Um, I don't demand. I don't think I ever get that forceful. Um, but you really should. It's a wicked resource. And thank you so much for contributing to it too. There is also the Facebook group, uh, which is sort of a, a support network for marketers in between the events. Um, so you just need to search on Facebook for the marketing meetup and just ask questions and sort of be nice to each other there. The next Cambridge marketing meetup is the first Tuesday of October. Uh, we'll be speaking marketing 4.0 and to blog or not to blog. It's not really a question. And uh, excitingly, we're also in London next Tuesday, Bedford the day after, and Norwich on the 25th of September. And then as of next month as well, probably we'll also be in Birmingham. So there'll be five events per month. Madness. Absolute madness. All that's left for me to do now is to close and say thank you very much, you wonderful human beings, for spending the evening with me and with the speakers and one another. I hope you had a really nice time. I hope you come back. Thank you very much. Thank you.